What time is it? It's time for the Abbott and Costello Show. We're on the air for ABC here in Hollywood. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go with the Abbott and Costello Show. Yes, it's the Abbott and Costello Show. Produced and transcribed in Hollywood for your listening and laughing pleasure. Chuckles with a carload and music by Matty Malnick. So hold on to your chairs, folks, for here they are, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. What's up? What's up tonight? A big party. I say, what's up tonight? Well, I want to tell you, I took my aunt Meg to the football game at the Coliseum this afternoon. Yes. At the end of the first quarter, a drunk came in and yelled, "Who's gay?" Aunt May jumped up and says, "I am." <laughs> Your aunt May doesn't know much about football, does she? Oh, she thinks the rooting section is the front end of a pig. I. <laughs> she does. She does. Have it. Right. Which end is? Right. <laughs> you don't know much about football yourself, do you? Oh, are you kidding? You should have seen me in college, Abbott. I was a triple threat man. I could run, kick, and pass. Boy, I could really throw it in those days. <laughs> you're, not doing, you're, you're not doing so bad tonight, either. <laughs> One time I made 30 touchdowns in the last 10 seconds of the game. Wait a minute, wait a minute. How could you make 30 touchdowns in 10 seconds? I had to. My mother had a bet on the game. <laughs> you know, the quarterback would drop back, and then the left guard tackle and left end would open up a hole, and you, a hole big enough you could drive a truck through. And what did you do? I drove the truck. <laughs> <laughs> Once I caught a kickoff and started down the field, there were only 21 men between me and the goalpost. 21 men? Yes, even my teammates hated me. I... <laughs> That's enough, Castell. I don't think you know the first thing about football. Tell me, uh, what is an unbalanced line? An unbalanced line? Yes. Sydney Greenstreet's belt. I... <laughs> Furthermore, I don't think you're even at a football game this afternoon. Oh, yes, I was. Uh... During the half oh, yes, I was. During the halftime, a section of the bleachers where all the coeds were sitting collapsed, and I dashed over. Uh, did you render first aid? Yes, sir. I picked up a cute little blonde and started carrying her out when a fellow says, Here, give her to me. And I said, Nothing doing, brother. There's plenty more back there. Go get your own. Oh, get him out of here. Well, there's a sample of the high-grade nonsense you'll be hearing for the next half hour. But before we get back to it, listen to this. Beautiful suit you wear tonight. I like it myself. You look like a Rhapsody in brown. All right, never mind that. Uh, look, where have you been all day, Lou? Huh? Where have you been all day? Well, I'll tell you, I was helping my Aunt May. She refurnished the whole house for Thanksgiving. Uh, what kind of furniture did she get? Chairs, tables, and beds. No, 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 no. I mean, uh, what period is the furniture? Louis the Fourteenth, uh, uh, colonial, or late French uh, provincial? It's early army surplus. Uh, what? <laughs> Does Uncle Mike like the furniture? Yes, especially the four-poster bed. Last night he kicked her over the end of the he kicked her right over the end of the four-poster bed. 
Why in the world did he do a thing like that? He dreamed he was playing for Notre Dame and his team needed the extra point. <laughs> your, your Uncle Mike is just like you. You're both dopes. Yeah, my Uncle Mike is no dope, Abbott. He happens to be a very clever inventor. He just invented a new kind of motorcycle, and it's so fast. Get this. This motorcycle is so fast that you can get on it in, in Los Angeles at midnight and be in Cucamonga at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Is that so? Yeah, but there's only one thing wrong with it. What's that? Who wants to be in Cucamonga at 2 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> well, that just proves, proves what I've always said. Your Uncle Mike is a shiftless loafer. He gambles away every cent that he gets. Oh, no, he reformed that, but he's never going to shoot dice or play cards again. Nah, he said that before. I know, but this time a judge said it. I... <laughs> Does Uncle Mike uh, still drink as much as ever, Lou? Nah, now he quits when he's had enough. <laughs> How can he tell when he's had enough? Well, he sits across the table from Aunt May, and he sits there with a big button and he starts drinking. The minute Aunt May starts looking good to him, he knows he's had enough. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Lou, does your Uncle Mike and Aunt May fight as much as they used to? No, but they had an argument yesterday. She crowded him in the puss and then kicked him in the stomach. <laughs> Kicked him in the stomach. Yeah, but that was his fault. He turned around. <laughs> <laughs> Does your Uncle Mike st still work for the orange growers, Lou? Oh, yes, yes. A very important man in the orange business, Abbott. He's the only guy that can tell a California orange from a Florida orange. How does he do it? Well, he cuts an orange in half, holds it over a map of the United States, and squeezes it. If it's a California orange, it squirts all over Florida. <laughs> Look, Lou, yes. did you have a good Thanksgiving dinner? Well, I'll tell you as soon as I get to it. Yes, I did. I found it. Yes. <laughs> but we didn't have any turkey. You didn't have a turkey? Why not? By the time I got to the butchers, all the finance companies were closed. <laughs> you mean to tell me that the price of turkeys is that high? Are uh, the prices high? Yeah. There was one woman in a butcher shop that didn't buy anything, and that weighed two pounds. <laughs> Never mind that. Did you buy a turkey? I handed the butcher two bucks and says, what kind of turkey can I buy for that? And he handed me an egg. An egg? Yeah, <laughs> an egg. Hey, so go sit on that and hatch out your own turkey. <laughs> what do you think I got? I got a duck. A duck? <laughs> Will you please talk to him? Where did you eat your Thanksgiving dinner? Over at the YWCA. The YWCA? Why, men aren't allowed in there. I know, but I love to go there. It takes so many of them to throw you out. <laughs> You wanted to have Thanksgiving dinner with a girl. Why didn't you have a... Why didn't you make a date with my wife? My wife's twin sister, Ella. Abbott, when I sit down at the table for Thanksgiving, I want to see a turkey, not an old crow. I... <laughs> <laughs> Ella's a lovely girl. Now, if you want to ma make a hit with her, why, why don't you buy her a box of candy? You know, she has a sweet tooth. I know, I've seen it. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad she hasn't got some more to go with it. <laughs> Uh, gentlemen, I've got a few turkeys left over from the Thanksgiving rush. Would you like to buy one? What kind of turkeys have you got? I've got Texas turkeys and Vermont turkeys. How do you tell them apart? The Vermont turkeys are still wearing Hoover buttons. <laughs> I don't think we'd be interested. Turkeys are too high this year. Well, then, how about buying a raffle ticket on a great big turkey for a quarter? I'll take two of them. Here's a half a buck. Thanks. Here's your tickets for the biggest turkey in town. Wait, just a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. These aren't tickets for, uh, tickets for a turkey. These tickets are for the Abbott and Costello radio show. Do you know of a bigger turkey? <laughs> he can't get away with that, Abbott. I'll break every bone in his body. Where did he go? Right through that door. He did, huh? Yeah. Open up that door. Well, the door is open. I, what are you going to do I, about I, it? What I, do you want? I just wanted to say goodbye. <laughs> Costello, it's a shame. Thanksgiving Day is nearly over, and, and you didn't even get a turkey. Well, someday I'll be rich. Someday yeah. I'll have plenty of money. And when I do, I'll get a seat on the Chicago Stockyard. You, you mean stock exchange? I mean Stockyard. When all that meat comes in, I want to be there. <laughs> Costello, I'm afraid you'll never have any money. You don't know the value of a dollar. How can I? Every time I learn the value of a dollar, some guy in Washington changes it. <laughs> Thanksgiving, boy. Look, Costello, it's our secretary, Viola Vaughn. 
Viola, you look beautiful. How about you and me stepping out after the show? Oh, tonight? Gee, mm. I'll be tied up at home tonight. Good. Maybe you'll be more fun that way. I'll come over and I'll tie you. <laughs> Uh, Viola, you must be very busy. Every time Costello asks you for a date, you're busy. Well, I am busy. Mondays, I go to gym class. Tuesdays, I play golf. Wednesdays, I go horseback riding. And when I have nothing on, I go swimming. <laughs> you couldn't pick a better time for it. <laughs> on second thought, this is Thanksgiving, and I'm kind of hungry for a date. Then why not go out with me? Abbott, she says she's hungry. She's not starving. Right? <laughs> now, suppose I did invite you over to my house tonight, Costello. What would you do? Oh, well, we'd play games. We'd play, like, hide-and-seek, maybe post office. Oh, right? that's a kid game. Not the way I play it. All right, now, right, right. <laughs> Well, how do you play hide-and-seek? Well, first you count up to ten, then run and hide in the closet. Then I count up the ten and run and I hide in the closet. It's a lot of fun. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Where, where, what, what? Where, where does the fun come in? We both run to the same closet. I... <laughs> nah, Costello, I don't think I'll invite you over. You're too fickle. What do you mean? Well, last week after the rehearsal, you were taking a nap, and I sneaked in, and you were dreaming and saying, No, Rita, no, Rita, I won't kiss you. No, no, no. For what? My name is not Rita. What are you kicking about? I said no, didn't I? Ah, <laughs> uh, Viola was right. You are fickle. You're always flirting with girls. Last night I saw you driving down Hollywood Boulevard and you winked at a girl. I only winked because something got in my eye. <laughs> and she got in your car, too. <laughs> well, I'm surprised at you two arguing over girls. You're right, Viola. Yeah. They aren't worth it. Women are responsible for a lot of stupid things. Shame on you, Abbott, bringing your mother into this conversation. <laughs> you idiot. Why don't you find yourself a girl and get married? Viola, you're the kind of a girl I'd love to be married to. Oh, why do you want to marry me? Being married to you would be wonderful. We could have ten children. Ten children? Yes, and if we like them the second year, we could have ten more. <laughs> Viola would be silly to marry you. All you do is chase girls. Mr. Abbott is right, Costello. I understand that you've kissed every blonde in Hollywood. I have not. Well, all right. Name one blonde in Hollywood you haven't kissed. I'll name two. <laughs> Alan Ladd and Van Johnson. <laughs> you idiot. Alan Ladd and Van Johnson wouldn't kiss you. They wouldn't? No, they wouldn't. Okay, I'll scratch their names out of my book. <laughs> See, Viola, I was right. Costello's not the guy for you. He's, he has no brains, he has no looks, and he has no money. I'm beginning to think you're right. Just a minute. Now, listen here, Abbott. If you don't stop crabbing me with girls, I'm going to hide your corkscrew. No! 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 no. <laughs> ah, the plot thickens. Before it gets too thick, let's interrupt it for another reminder on a serious subject. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here's our new singer, Hal Winters. Let's give Hal a nice big hand. A nice Hal big Winters. hand for Hal Winters. Hey, hey. Thanks a million, a million thanks. 
thanks to you for everything that love could bring you brought me each tender love word you have learned to say is hidden away in memory's bouquet Your caresses taught me You made a million dreams come true And so I'm saying thanks a million to you For I remember too The tenderness that your caresses taught me Costello, Costello, come over here. What are you doing out there in the hall? Yeah, but the employees of the network just raffled off a turkey. And my number was 11896432 And? And? And the fella standing right next to me, he had number 11896432651. So he said to me, I'll trade you my number 11896432651 yes. for your number 11896436592. So? So I traded him my number 11896432651 for his number 11396432652. Well, who won the turkey? One of the vice presidents with ticket number three. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't care, Rabbit. I don't like turkeys anyway. If all the turkeys in the world were laid end to end, that's the part I would get. <laughs> well, you know, Lou, my wife is crazy about turkey. Today when she sat down at the table, she had a turkey neck. Well, if she were a muffler, nobody would notice it. <laughs> What's that roll of paper under your arm? <laughs> That's a Thanksgiving play we're going to do for the people tonight, and I wrote it myself. Oh, what's the name of your play? I call it The Brave Little Band of Pilgrims Who Landed on Honest John's Rock. <laughs> yeah, dummy, that's Plymouth Rock. How do you like that? Even in those days, Honest John was the only one that could get a Plymouth. I... <laughs> Never mind that. Let's get along with the play. <laughs> For our hero, Lou Costello's play, we take you back to the year 1620, where we find a brave little band of adventurers aboard the good ship Mayflower. The brave captain has eaten nothing but fish, nothing but fish for 90 days. But that doesn't faze him. <laughs> Let's listen to this fish phase. <laughs> First mate, John Alden Costello, where are you? Here I am, Captain Miles Standish Abbott. <laughs> we've, had, we've had some pretty tough weather. How's the ship holding up? I have a report on the mizzen mast. What about the mizzen mast? It's been mizzen for three days. <laughs> Look out! <laughs> there's a note stuck to that dagger. Aha! There's mutiny among the men. Read this note, first mate John Alden Costello. The first mate is a dirty land lover, and he should drop dead. Which one of you swabs wrote this? I did, sir. Give that man 20 lashes and a box of Snickers. <laughs> I know it, we do. We put the whole crew on bread and water. Why pamper them? Let them eat the regular food. <laughs> Captain Miles Stanish Habit, me thinks you made a mistake. 
When we left England, I think we forgot to untie the boat from the dock. What makes you say what makes you say that? Just look behind us. We're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and people are still waving goodbye to us. <laughs> look. Look, John Alden Costello, there's land ahead. We should be proud. The Mayflower has broken all records for the Atlantic crossing. Yes, we beat the Queen Elizabeth by 326 years. <laughs> Thank Columbus for showing us the way. He marked the route. That's funny. I didn't see a Burma shave sign all the way across. <laughs> John Alden Costello, watch where you're steering the boat. Don't worry, Captain Miles Standish Abbott. I know every reef along this coast. There's one now. You idiot. That's the shore. Quick, drop the anchor. Aye, aye, sir. Here she goes. <laughs> John Alden Castello, what are you doing down there in the water? What are you asking me for? Why don't you ask the sound man? He just got soaked. <laughs> I forgot to let go of the anchor. <laughs> so the little boat Mayflower made the crossing. The shore was deserted. No Indians came down to greet them. It was 7 o'clock on a Sunday night. All the Indians were home in their wigwam. Listen. They're all trying to guess the mystery tune on Stop the Tom Tom. <laughs> First mate John Alden Costello drops the gangplank and down the runway comes the beautiful Priscilla. John Alden Costello, honey bun. Just think of it. You and I are the first people to set foot on this new land. This virgin territory belongs to no one. Priscilla, my love, are you sure this land belongs to no one? Look what it says on that rock. What? Los Angeles city limits. <laughs> John Alden Costello, our people are starving. We must go into the woods and get food for our little band of pilgrims. Look over there, Abbott. There's a field of corn. That's Indian corn. That's maize. Do you think May would mind if we take a little? Uh, <laughs> what are you talking about? You just said the corn belonged to May. I did not. I said the corn was May. Then it's May's corn. That's right. So what's wrong with finding May and asking for some of her corn? I did. I didn't say the, the corn belonged to May. I merely said the corn was May. How do you like that? Here it is, the year is 1620, and this guy is starting a routine. <laughs> Stella Mays is Indian corn. The Indians grind their own corn. Those Indians are smart. We pay riders to grind ours. <laughs> oh, here comes an Indian. I'll be friendly and say hello to him. How do you say hello to an Indian? How? I asked you first. <laughs> I just told you. Told me what? How? If I knew how, I wouldn't be asking you. <laughs> what did you ask me? How? Now, now you've got it. Got it. Now I'm really mixed up. <laughs> Stella, they may be after our scalps. Oh, uh, look, there's a note tied on that arrow. I'll read it. Men, are you slowly losing your hair? <laughs> See, Chief Tomahawk can lose it all at once. Costello, here comes an Indian, and he has his hand raised. Say something to him. Chief, you can go now. Bud, me scout. Me chief, cheap underwear. Why do they call you chief, cheap underwear? Me creep up on you. <laughs> Step on the side and make way for big chief. That must have been a super chief. <laughs> Watch him language, pale face. Meet him, big chief, running water. He looks like a big drip. <laughs> chief, meet my friend, John Alden Costello. Are you gay? Are you gay? Yeah, but we gotta get better actors. <laughs> you dummy, you're reading that wrong. That's, oh, oh. Listen, Tubby. I've got as much right to play an Indian as you have to play John Alden. Oh, yeah? I'll have you know that my great-grandfather goes back to Martha Washington. He does? Yes, of course, he only goes back there when George isn't home. <laughs> oh, who cares about that? I've got troubles of my own. 
Why, only this morning, I was sending up some smoke signals to my sweetheart, Pocahontas. And what happened? Her father came along and put out my fire. <laughs> well, I've got to go now. And as we say in Indian, you far da umstead, I'm a hawk to you. And your father's busted tomahawk to you, too. <laughs> John Alden Costell, I haven't the courage to propose to the fair Priscilla. You, as my best friend, must do it for me. You mean you want me to make love to the fair Priscilla for you? Yes. He doesn't know me very well, does he, folks? <laughs> Go into Priscilla's cabin, John Alden Costello. Propose to her. Propose to her for me. Tell her, tell her I'm a soldier. And if she refuses me, I'll go back to the bottle. You mean you'll go back to the battle? You go back to what you like, and I'll go back to what I like. Uh, <laughs> no, now go no, ahead, no. Ah, oh, John Alden Costello, my little bouncing Boston baked bean. <laughs> ah, Priscilla, my little tomato. Smother me with the ketchup of your kisses. When I'm close to you like this, something cold seems to spread all over me. It does. Yes, you dropped your popsicles down the back of my neck. <laughs> Pray tell me, why have you come here? To propose to you for my dear friend, Miles Standish Abbott, the poor broken down guy. He couldn't come himself. He's all shot. <laughs> He's practically falling apart. He can't even read a, read a straight line anymore. <laughs> and he's got plenty of company, too. <laughs> Priscilla, my love. I'm not used to straight lines, either. <laughs> Priscilla, my love. You couldn't go for him, could you? Are you proposing for him? Sure. It must be wonderful to have a true devoted friend like you. If Miles Standish Abbott had another friend like me, he wouldn't need any enemies. <laughs> oh, why don't you speak for yourself, John Alden Costello, honey? I'd love to marry you, Priscilla, but I can't. I'm already married. Wait a minute, Costello. We're doing a story from history. And the history books say that John Alden was a bachelor. That was before the historians found out about John's other wife. Oh, let me out of here. Don't go away, folks. Our madmen aren't through with you yet. Right now, they want you to hear this. <laughs> By doing our Thanksgiving play, we didn't get a chance to do our Sam Shovel detective mysteries tonight. That's right, Abbott, but Sam Shovel will be back next Thursday night. Well, uh, what is your Sam Shovel story for next week? Well, it's one of my liveliest cases. I call it the case of the chorus girls who went swimming in their underwear or down to the sea in slips. <laughs> well, that's, that's about all for tonight, Gaston. All except telling the folks about our small gang that helps put this show together. Our writing staff is headed by Eddie Foreman with Paul Conlon, Pat Costello, Martin Ragaway, and Lennox Stern. And let's not forget our capable producer, Charles Vander. And let's not forget to say goodnight. Good night, folks. Good night to everybody in Patterson. Good night. <laughs> Listen each Thursday night at this time for another great Abbott and Costello show, produced and transcribed in Hollywood. Be sure to stay tuned for the outstanding entertainment which follows throughout the evening on this ABC station.